I've been looking for Clark's Nutcrackers for about a year, when one day, quite unexpectedly, I found them. There was so much being communicated. Then it got quiet as they turned their efforts to clusters of pine cones, driving their strong bills in between the scales to pull out the seeds. Many times they'd create their own makeshift perch by holding on to a footful of pine needles. They can store 30 to 150 seeds in their sublingual pouch. That's the expandable area of their throat. A glance at the nutcracker's profile will quickly tell you the status of its seed harvest by the size of its pouch, whether low, half full, or very full. And in this case, even with reddish pink stained feathers from pinecone resin. Once it collects its bounty, it flies off to cache the seeds for later consumption by burying them in soil. That will work for part of the year, but what about in winter and spring? How do they retrieve seeds if there's many feet of snow on the ground? One study found that nutcrackers that live in high elevation stored 90% of their seeds above ground, such as in clumps of needle foliage, lichen, or wedged underneath bark along branches. For those in lower elevation forests, 56% of caches were above ground. But snow isn't a complete deterrent, as one researcher saw that a nutcracker had dug a hole through eight inches of snow to retrieve a cache of food it had previously stored. What's even more miraculous is their spatial memory. Each nutcracker is potentially caching up to 500 seeds per hour, making it tens of thousands of seeds by the end of fall. The net result is being able to remember upwards of 10,000 caching locations at a given time. They use landmarks to help them find food stores, such as trees, shrubs, logs, and rocks. After about nine months, recall accuracy is less reliable. Seeds are buried at precisely the right depth needed for germination, so those that are not retrieved have the potential to become the next generation of pine trees. In addition, nutcrackers store seeds as far as 20 miles from their source tree further assisting the trees to expand their territories. It is estimated that some pine forests, particularly those of high elevation, like the white bark pine, have been planted exclusively by the Clark's nutcracker. The relationship between the nutcrackers and the pines is one of profound mutualism. The forest is both their provider and their storehouse, and in return, the nutcrackers disperse their seeds, ensuring the tree's survival. This is especially true of the white bark pine, which grows in the harsh subalpine environment between 9,000 and 11,000 feet. Most pine cones open up and release their seeds when it's warm and dry, but with the white bark, the scales on their cones stay permanently closed, even when the seeds become ripe. Not even fire will open their cones, and their seeds don't have a wing to be dispersed by the wind. The trees are completely dependent on the nutcrackers to plant their seeds. The cones grow in clusters at the very top of the tree, perfect for drawing in a nutcracker flying overhead. The population of white bark pines has been declining due to mountain pine beetle infestations and a non-native fungus known as blister rust. It's not just the white bark pine that's affected by these, but any of the five needled pines, such as limber, Rocky Mountain bristlecone, and foxtail pines, among others. The fungus is native to Eastern Asia and was introduced to North America around 1900 through white pine seedlings that were brought over to be planted. Unfortunately, the effects of the fungus on the trees continues today, threatening high elevation ecosystems. Considerable conservation efforts are being made, though. Blister rust resistant white bark pines are being bred and replanted in the wild. The seeds of the white bark pine are the Cadillac of pine seeds, highly nutritious, loaded with fat, protein, and calories. 
it would take 20 Douglas fir seeds to get the same energy found in a single white bark seed. Clark's nutcrackers typically nest in early March, which is still quite cold and snowy. If cached food supplies are plentiful, they may even nest in January or February. This strikes me as being potentially tough on their young, but apparently they get through it with devoted parental care. Nutcrackers are part of the corvid family and is one of the few species in this group where the males help incubate the eggs and even develop a brood patch. The advantage of breeding earlier is that it gives the young plenty of time to grow and learn how to start caching seeds on their own by late summer. Clark's nutcrackers are sometimes confused with the similar looking Canada jay. Their ranges do overlap a bit, particularly in the Rocky Mountains of the U.S. and Canada. If you're not sure how to tell them apart, look at the bill. The nutcracker's bill is long and dagger-like, whereas the Canada jay's bill is much shorter. And also, keep an ear out for their calls. I don't have a recording of the Canada jay, but their calls are made up of the harsh chatters and clear whistles and sound more like that of a blue jay. By comparison, the nutcracker's calls are harsh and grating. And if you listen closely, you can even hear the sound of their wing beats as they fly from one tree to another. Is there anything about Clark's nutcrackers that's not incredible? I have so much respect and appreciation for these birds. Have you ever seen one before? Or, if you live in Europe or Asia, any other kind of nutcracker in your area? Feel free to leave a comment down below. Thank you for watching. That's all for this time. I'll see you again soon.